All right, we are going to debate veganism today. Um, on the pro-vegan side, we have Prometheus up here on the top right. And then on the top left, we have Leonardo, uh, Leonardo and he's going to be on the anti-vegan side. And uh, yeah, let's start with uh, Prometheus. Go ahead and explain your stance on why we should be vegan. Sure. So when we talk about veganism, I believe it's defined as trying to minimize unnecessary suffering of animals. And that word unnecessary is extremely important because we must recognize that we live in a world where sometimes uh, we need to create some level of suffering in order to just personally survive, in order to be able to move throughout this world. That, and, and for every breath that you take, you may be stealing a breath from someone else, you know? So it's important to recognize that we're trying to minimize harm. Uh, now, furthermore, I think that the reason why I think that veganism is such a uh, powerful ideology line of argument is because you can or argue for its morality in a bunch of different ways. Uh, and that's important because I would argue morality is fundamentally subjective and therefore having the capability to argue in favor of it from many different angles is extremely important. Now you can argue in favor of veganism from the perspective of a utility argument, right? You can argue uh, from, the, from the utility argument through an argument from environmentalism uh, or from, an, ar uh, from, from an, an avenue of trying to minimize disease, from the avenue of trying to increase the healthiness of diets. All of these things are utility arguments from morality, and you can attack it from many different ways, right? You could also make, it, uh, make an argument from morality from the perspective of having a baseline respect for the sentience of animals. And I actually think that this is a line of argument with regards to morality that people hold, but they are a bit hypocritical about. That they uh, are, are against the, um, the, the beating of animals because, uh, because they feel like doing that is just unnecessarily cruel. It's unnecessary. You don't need to do that. And yet they are in favor of things like eating them, which necessarily includes the killing of them, necessarily includes the enclosure of them, necessarily includes uh, uh, lots of things which cause pain and eliminate the potential for further pleasure in life, right? So if they were consistent with regards to this, then they would, they, then, then, then they would be opposed to uh, the unnecessary suffering that occurs as a result of animals. So I'll leave it at that. I think that veganism is a broad moral landscape and applies to various different forms of morality. And I think that I can hopefully make an argument in favor of why you, as a viewer perhaps, may, maybe not necessarily Leonard, um, should be in favor of it because it's coherent with your own sense of morality. Okay, so do I go now? Yes. Okay, so I would first and foremost not define my view as anti-veganism, not necessarily, in the sense that I do not believe veganism is somehow immoral. I'm not one of those guys who believes, oh, actually, you need meat for X and X and X, because sure, you do need meat only if you don't have the necessary supplements somewhere else. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't go for that angle. I do think veganism is completely moral. My question is more about absolutism. I myself have significantly reduced meat consumption and specifically beef um, because of uh, climate change. In my entire household, those two types of meat are completely out. We still sometimes have chicken or uh, you know pork or fish, but we are completely out of lamb and um, and anything that has to do with cows, precisely because of environmental reasons. So I don't necessarily consider myself an anti-vegan. I just think that that is not necessary. For um for living a moral life, I think some flaw is uh, some flaw in veganism is itself its own kind of diet. You know, we call it sometimes flexitarianism or reductionism, um, not necessarily vegans. I do think it is ultimately, and I do agree with vegans here that we have to reduce animal consumption uh, according to at least one ethical framework, 
Um, if we have more than one, then yes, I do agree broadly that if you can argue from for one position from multiple different uh, moral angles, I think you are onto something. You, know, you are onto something that is common to many ethical paradigms. Um, but in truth, my main argument isn't that we shouldn't reduce animal consumption at all. I think we should, and I think we should substantially. I think it's even a matter of life and death that we do, um, because something like 25% of emissions comes from the food industry. So we need to be mindful of that. Uh, it's just that I'm not an absolutist. Uh, I, I do not believe a vegan lifestyle is the only non-contradictory lifestyle. Uh, I do not believe that that is the only possible way in which we can uh, understand our ethics. Uh, that's sort of my 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 position on the topic all uh, right sounds good so yeah now we'll just uh it, it won't be anything formal just a back and forth you guys can counter each other's thoughts and till the end sure uh, perhaps we can clarify the terminology we're using here because i'm a little confused maybe i misheard i think you mentioned solipsism and from my understanding that's just defined as you know the only it's, it's like an epistem epistemological position the only thing you can know as that your own mind exists. How could you describe to me or explain to me how you're relating that to the conversation around veganism? Well, I, I don't remember I, I said that, but um, I, I suppose it has something to do with it. Uh, sure. At the end of maybe the day, it's the you. maybe I missed. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure you? what what exactly I said that you that you um, heard is that. Um, well, you in said what context you're... was it? I heard it twice as well, but I wasn't sure what the word was, and I was going to look it up because I'm not familiar with that word that even Prometheus said. Well, but um, I'm terribly sorry. Did I say solipsism? When, when did I say that? I, I mean, I, I wrote it. Maybe you misspoke and you meant something Maybe. else. Yeah, because you, you said that you are like you are you are a, you in favor of solipsism because you think that you need to like reduce meat. because of climate change. Like I didn't fully understand this. I oh wanted... no, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, maybe it's in my quality. What I said that is my position is against absolutism. Oh. As an absolute, I am against veganism oh. as a maxim. Uh, All right. okay. What I believe is that, you know, veganism is fine as a goal in the same way that when we do politics, we can't really get to a utopia, but we can improve. Uh, so, so what I mean is that I'm in general against absolutism as an absolute veganism. I am against the idea that one has to never consume any animal products in order to lead a moral or ethical lifestyle. That's the idea that I'm against. But I don't think it's wrong to never consume animal products. And I don't think we shouldn't reduce the consumption. Um, we absolutely should. So yes, that that is, sorry, it wasn't solipsism. I think my issue that's was an interesting is conversation, I, but I it's not what I said. I had never heard the word absolutism. So that's probably why I thought that too. Yeah. All right, there okay, we go. Sorry. Okay, thank you. So that's good clarification, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not necessarily in favor of moral absolutism either, you know, because there's kind of like quite often there's like an almost deontological underpinning there where uh, this something is right and they're intrinsically right. And given the fact that I'm a moral subjectivist, I don't actually buy that. Right. Um, and my main line of argument is that I think that for the vast majority of people uh, that underlying their moral framework is something that is consistent and coherent with veganism and yet they don't actually apply to their everyday life right like for example uh leonard um you mentioned right now that you are actually uh, uh you actually reduced your meat intake etc because you want to help contribute to the minimization of uh or the, to contribute to the minimization of the negative effects of the meat industry on an environment, right? That's actually a type, that's actually a type of, an, of of veganism. It's called environmental veganism, and so your sense of morality, in a sense, right, has led you toward being a vegan. So, in a sense, even though you are on the quote unquote like uh, opposed to vegan side, you are a form of vegan, and that's actually why I, I I'm so uh, confident that. In time, veganism will eventually rise to become a, a, a far more popular ideology uh, because I think it coheres with so many different moral worldviews. I, I think that's one way to look at it. And, and I don't think you're entirely wrong. I do think veganism is about to become more popular. You know, um, there are various countries that are now just sort of starting to get their act together when it comes to, to climate change. And even that is something of an exaggeration. 
Um, I do think that the problem is going to get a little bit worse before it gets better. Um, and so I do think that that is going to push people towards veganism, especially because there is some good evidence that at the very least in the US, the significant amount of people who are vegan has reduced uh, greenhouse emissions for that sector of the industry. So I do think if we focus on positive effects of adopting vegan diets, that is going to become more popular. I do, I do think so. There's also been some research, I think, in uh, some research. Sorry, I think in Israel about um, completely artificial meat, uh, and I do think some people that face a little bit of cognitive dissonance between not wanting to kill animals and eating animals, they might jump into that. So I do think you're right, broadly, that veganism is going to become more popular. But what I object to is the label that I am a vegan because I don't think I'm a vegan. I don't consider myself a vegan or even a vegetarian. Uh, and even when it comes to that, something like um, environmental veganism, for instance, drinking milk has a much higher environmental impact than eating chicken. Uh, yet, typically, we think of uh, as a sort of progression, your first, you know, uh, uh, I think vegan, vegans call us carnists, but, you know, an, an omnivore, then a vegetarian, and then a vegan. However, you could have a lower impact if you eat some kinds of meat, like say something that's relatively little little uh, impact, like say chicken, it's still higher than uh, most any plant, but uh, much lower than lamb, much lower than, uh, than pork, sorry, much lower than, uh, yeah, it is lower than pork. And I think it is, and it's definitely much lower than beef. But if you drink milk, you've sort of ruined that. So what I'm against is a sort of progression that is like, that sort of, um, the idea that I think some vegans have that the less damage that you do to an animal, the less damage you're doing to the environment as a whole. I think there is some, some big distance between these two concepts. I think becoming a, a vegan for ethical reasons and for environmental reasons takes many different forms and it leads you down very different paths. And if you're not a perfect vegan, sorry, I rolled my arms there. Um, if you're not a perfect vegan, that that shines much more strongly because a vegetarian might never consume in a product that necessitates an animal death. They might never eat any meat. They might only say drink milk or eat cheese um, or I don't know, eat eggs. Uh, but if they drink milk, they're having a much higher environmental impact than someone who sometimes eats meat, but eats meat that has much, uh, much lesser uh, uh, emissions. So I, I think that yes, broadly, we come to veganism from different angles. But I think that that label then becomes a little bit diffused. I think that what you and me are is very different. I don't think you can classify us both as vegans. Um, so my general argument is that, yes, I do think it, broadly most systems of ethics lead you to consume less animal products. But then that is more of a thing of an attitude. Uh, it's, it's more about individual choices. You're going to eat less beef. You're going to eat less pork. You're going to drink less milk. But maybe you're not going to reduce your egg intake. I don't know. Um, rather than one big label, veganism, that you can apply to all of these ideologies. I think that the nuances between them is very, very important. You know, some people are, are only vegans for health reasons. Uh, so, and those reasons are not quite, uh, they don't stick with you quite as much as, say, animal reasons. Some of those are for environmental reasons. And while we care about animals, not necessarily to the same extent that someone who is only vegan for animal reasons. So I think these things are different. I don't think we're both vegan. So I don't, I don't I think, think we do both. I don't disagree that there are distinctions between these th these two things, right? For example, we both may want to reduce the consumption of of, uh, of animal meat, right? But we might have very different reasons for coming to that conclusion. So there there are distinctions, but those distinctions are encapsulated by the different variations of veganism. That's why we mentioned environmental veganism would be very different from somebody who, someone who's an environmental vegan would have a very different process coming to that conclusion than someone who uh, is a vegan for, for uh, moral reasons, right? So j the fact that we come to the conclusion through different means doesn't mean that we don't share the same conclusion. And that's all what being a vegan means, which is that you're sharing the same conclusion. Now, if you want to further clarify, that's why we have different categories like environmental vegan or a utilitarian vegan or a deontological vegan, et cetera, right? We have further clarifying subcategories, but I, but the overall category, veganism, just, just all that indicates is that you've come to the, the same underlying conclusion, the same underlying action. And I so I don't wanna necessarily debate whether or not you fall under the category of vegan, right? It's not particularly interesting to me, right? I would just simply say that the category of vegan is a broad category and it's useful as a broad category. 
And we also have subcategories, which are useful in terms of helping identify how people come to those conclusions, the moral calculus they engage in to come to that, uh, that end conclusion. Now, the question I do really want to ask, since that you seem to be an environmental, you, you seem to come, I, I don't want to put you under there. Uh, you come to oppose the consumption of meat or wanting to reduce the consumption of meat um, because of environmental reasons. I would like to ask you, uh, like I would like to delve into your moral reasons, uh, whether or not you have moral reasons to not eat uh, meat. Is, is that possible or do you want to move in a different direction? Oh, no, I think that, that that's a perfectly fair question. In fact, it is related to something that I was going to ask you, um, given that we touched this, this idea that you can apply the same broad category to things that have the same underlying conclusion. Um, precisely, before, before I move on to answering your question, can you answer one for me? Can you? Um, sure. What's the worst part for you about the meat industry, for animals? I don't mean for the environment, I mean for animals. Ethically, what is the worst? Is it the enclosure? Is it the limited range of movement? Is it the poor diet? Is it the, uh, you know, the forced pregnancy? Or is it the death of the animal? What is the worst part of it for you? You've had to pick one. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't think I would be able to tell. Um, let, let me think about that. I think that perhaps the worst part about the entire experience is probably the death of the animal. And the reason, the reasoning behind it is because it's, a, it's an elimination of the continued potential to experience, right? And my moral system, underlying my moral system, what grants something to be worthy of consideration is the capability to experience pain and pleasure, right? And once you have, uh, once you have that capability, and you have a baseline level of sentience, right? Then you're both worthy of moral consideration from me and you're worthy of uh, my essentially moral time, right? And so the cessation of, the, the cessation of that, the elimination of any fu future potential for experience is probably something that I find to be an immense negative. But I think it's also important to recognize that it's very difficult to like calculate the which particular like suffering is the worst because there is variations right like for example for one for one animal uh his treatment in the facility might be like not as bad in terms of like an enclosure right it might be free yeah. reign so for that one it, it probably wouldn't be as bad but for another animal it might be far worse they might be um packed like sardines so i think it's really a case-by-case -case basis Yes, that is very interesting. But I think with that information, I can answer the question that you asked me, and that is my moral reason. Well, I broadly subscribe to a sort of neo-Stoic, sort of virtue ethics inspired moral philosophy. And the thing about that for me is that, uh, and I think I discussed this with, with Carson Hughes in a previous debate, is the theory of appropriation, where your moral duty is for that which you can consider to be part of your own. And the thing about that is that you do that calculation according to Stoic ethics based on common traits. But this has a catch, of course, and that is you have common traits with pretty much everything that exists, but to different degrees. So to me, the main problem with, with the death of a, with, a, with the meat industry is not so much the death of the animal itself, because I'm not so much concerned with the continued existence of perception. Because to me, and uh, forgive me if this is a little bit recent in my memory, but I, I recently went to um, you know, if you don't know in Chile, there's a, there's a museum called the Museo de la Memoria, the Museum of, of, of Memory, that is about the dictatorship. And there's this very interesting and very heartbreaking interview about a, a witness to, well, she was tortured too, but she was also a witness to torture um, in the national stadium. And there comes a point where someone is suffering so much that the only kind thing to wish for is their death. And in that sense, I think that the greatest evil that you can perpetrate against an animal is that which they can understand. And I don't think animals, at least not most of them, perhaps elephants or very intelligent animals can. I mean, they can, of course, they can suffer from the death of a, of a close one. You know, this is, has been noted since the times of David Hume, that they know that if an animal has died, that they might be next. They suffer from that. I know that. Um, 
but their own death is something that animals don't really understand to the same extent that they understand their own pain. Like, for instance, being packed as sardines. And so to me, the greater evil would be to keep an animal in that kind of, in that kind of containment. If you kill an animal at that point, well, it's essentially an act of mercy. The animal is suffering way beyond what it can tolerate. And so killing them is actually Wait, but an act of mercy. If I can pause you there, I think yeah. this is actually is a false dichotomy. Because I think you're putting uh, the analysis, the moral calculus into a situation where either you keep the, these animals packed like sardines within this particular area or you kill them. And that's not the two options. In reality, there are alternative options which are far more ethical in terms of like a moral calculus. Yeah, I, I think you're right. But I'm not necessarily arguing that these are our only two options. Uh, what I'm arguing is that precisely when, when you want to figure out someone's moral position, you take them to an extreme example. This is not a false dichotomy. It's a hypothetical dichotomy. I'm asking you, what if you only had two choices? I'm not declaring that you only have two choices, but what if? What I'm trying to illustrate is not that the only viable choice to free animals of their pain is to kill them. Of course, it's not. You can also free them. I'm, I'm not denying that. What I'm saying is that the killing isn't really the bad part. It's everything that comes before it. What I'm trying to explain to you is why I believe that it is not the continued existence of perception that is my moral basis. Instead, it's, it's what the animal can understand. And so to me, if you kill an animal and they don't even notice it, that is less unethical than if you were to keep the animal alive and conscious and torture. That's what I'm trying to argue. I'm not arguing that you only have two choices. Yeah, of course, you can free the animal. And I'm not against that. You know, by the way, I'm not against that. I'm not against radical action taken, taken by vegans to you know, destroy a, uh, you know, these kinds of enclosures uh, for animals. I, I'm not against that. Um, so I, I do think that the third option is completely, you know, it is material. It is not hypothetical. We can't just free the animals. I agree with you there. What I'm trying to explain to you is what, which part of the process I think is worse. And I think that keeping animals in dire conditions is worse than killing them. Because once the animal is dead, yes, according to your, to your moral framework, what matters in a moral calculation is the continued existence of perception. Uh, I think it's particularly negative perception. I think it is to actively harm another in a way that they can understand. And after an animal is dead, well, they, cannot, they can no longer understand what you've done to them. However, if that animal is alive, well, they can suffer through it. So to me, that is the most unethical part. Uh, so to finally answer the question that brought this whole thing to, to begin with, if I have any moral reasons to reduce meat consumption, it would be that one. It is impossible to keep all animals free range and supply meat for the whole world. There just isn't enough space. There aren't enough resources. It just cannot be done. So if someone wants to continue eating meat and in a more humane way, like say from a free range animal, we have to eat an infinitesimal amount of the meat that we eat today. We have to reduce it almost to zero uh, compared to what we have now. Um, so I do have some moral reasoning uh, for reducing my meat consumption. I, I do think it is unethical to keep animals in these conditions. Um, but I, like I said, I don't think it's inherently unethical to kill them. So I'm not against the farming of animals in proper farms. I'm, I'm not against that. Um, uh, so I'm that curious, is. is there like a sense of uh, just human exceptionalism to this line of moral reasoning that like the, the the line of reasoning that you're applying here would you also apply it to humans or is there like a, an exception that you draw well I, I would not argue that killing a human is ever ethical unless it is again a mercy kill or a assisted suicide or perhaps self-defense um but i do think that some basic moral principles uh, do apply like i think uh, i i do think that going back to the whole virtue ethics things, I think that the moral character of a torturer versus just a plain murderer, I think the torturer is worse. Wait, no, I my bad. Is worse. I, didn't, I didn't clarify what I meant. Right? So your basic line of argument is that you don't necessarily have a problem with the cessation, the cessation of, of experience of life, right? Mm -hmm. You have mainly have a problem with uh, the continued torture of the animals, et cetera, right? And okay. first of all, like my line of argument with that is, look, uh, earlier on, I tried to make it clear that uh, the, the counting, the counting of the suffering is dependent on the particular circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. So if that particular animal is being tortured within an inch of the life, right? Then yeah, the moral, uh, uh, in terms of the moral calculation, then yeah, it'd probably be better to have the mercy killing because uh, uh, there would be less suffering, right? Within that specific dichotomy, Right, though that, that that specific hypothetical. Yes. 
But in reality, we have alternative solutions, which is that, you know, we can be free them. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So um, the question that I was trying to ask you was mm -hmm. if you have a situation where there's a group of individuals who they enjoy killing, they really like killing um, humans, right? It's something that they, they, they enjoy doing. Um, we as a society have made it so that the vast, vast majority of killing has essentially been eliminated. Yeah. Uh, would you, would you, would you say that then that it's fine for us to retain that small level of killing or should we try our best to try to eliminate it and prevent it from occurring? Uh, you're, you're speaking of this group of humans who want to kill others? Yeah, because if, I'm asking if I want to prevent that. Yeah, sure. Because my, your line of argument, essentially what I'm hearing is that you were fine with uh, uh, reducing the consumption of animals to the point where it's incredibly minimal, but you're fine with allowing that minimal uh, level to exist in order to uh, uh, help the people who still want to eat meat. And to be clear, I'm not like comparing necessarily uh, 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 humans versus animals because there's different yeah, le levels understand. of sentience. I'm just trying to like understand whether or not there's like a human exceptionalist element to this where you draw an exception with your line of moral reasoning when it comes to humans versus animals well kind of i, I don't call i wouldn't call it that but i think it is a very interesting question i think it's at the heart of many i think they're called name the trait arguments between vegans and non-vegans which i think are very interesting um so the thing i'm the thing about that is that firstly i am starting from the position that a very egotistical position. And by that, I don't mean a selfish one. I mean one where I am the only person I have control of. And you can, I guess you can kind of see how this ties into my views of stoicism, right? So the reason I bring up hypotheticals like the one about the animals is because I cannot free all the animals. What is my choice is whether or not I will eat meat or I won't. That is my choice. Everything else we need to make as a choice collectively. I don't have power over all the animals that are about to die or that are about to be tortured. I cannot free them. So the thing about it is that that is why I focus on these uh, false, uh, as you would call them, false dichotomies so much. Because at the end of the day, we don't have the power to always take the third choice. Sometimes we don't. In the case I just mentioned of the torturer, um, you know, in that condition, you can't really free him. You can't really free him. You don't have the power. And so the thing about your question about human exceptionalism, I don't view it so much as exceptionalism as much as a recognition that we are all human. And so we are limited to human perspectives. Um, and part of that means that I do think that the death of a human is worse for other humans than the death of an animal, because we humans, uh, we engage in polities, we engage in political constructs. And so let's say, for instance, that there's this hypothetical group of people that you mentioned, you know, that they really like killing people. They don't torture them. They don't do anything, you know. They shoot him in the back of the head. The human doesn't feel a thing. Technically, no suffering has occurred. I still think that would be more unethical than doing the same thing to an unsentient animal because it has political implications that are far more reaching than the death of an animal could ever be. Because sure, uh, maybe the person didn't suffer. But now you that know about this group of people that go around killing other humans feel unprotected. And because you feel unsafe, that has repercussions in your own life. Because we humans hear from news uh, from all across the globe. We hear news from our own community. We hear how the justice system fails to prevent this from happening. And so to me, that would necessitate that we as a society have a rule that we must prevent these arbitrary killings, even, even if they don't cause suffering in the traditional sense. You know, Maybe the people that these guys are killing, they don't have any family, they don't have any friends. Maybe no one suffers because of their death, but it would still be unethical. I, I 100%. We would have to, sorry, where is and I 100 I 100% agree. And your basic line of argument is that um, with regards to this moral decision, this moral calculus uh, regarding the hypothetical, there may be further reaching consequences to this action, right? Mm -hmm. Further reaching moral consequences. And I would similarly argue that when it comes to um, the uh, uh, animal, the of animals, yeah, yeah, not in, not in the same way, obviously, because humans have had a lot level of sentience. There's influence of politics, but there is a, a, a higher level of consequences to the allowance, to the continued allowance of these killing of animals, which is that there is a level. I believe that this continued level of hypocrisy, which would exist both in your hypothetical society, which is, exists in this society, helps mm -hmm. contribute to 
a sort of casual cruelty which exists in our everyday life. And maybe people can't see it because they are currently uh, 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 they are currently within the ocean of this cruelty, right? But mm-hmm. once you're able to get out of it and onto the beach and be able to look at it from a bird's eye view, you are able to recognize it, right? Similarly to how we look at things in the in the past, right? Uh, we look at things in the past and we say, wow, that was really, really cruel thing. But we can't necessarily judge those individuals because, you know, that was the life that they lived in, right? That was the society they lived in. I, yeah. uh, But we can recognize that, like, that by participating within that institution, by participating with that lifestyle, they contributed to a system and, uh, which is incredibly cruel. And in a way, they were cruel themselves. And I would argue that that is something that occurs with regards to our continued consumption of morality, either in your hypothetical or in just real life, which is that it helps contribute to a culture of casual cruelty, which is something that we that I want to move past. I want to move toward a society where individuals are far more kinder to each other. There is actually a saying, which is that uh, don't judge a person by how they treat their equals. Judge a person by how they treat their lessers right by uh, uh uh don't judge them by how they treat their business partner judge them by how they treat their waiter right that is indicative of both in, uh, how an individual uh, acts and uh how a society's institutions are going to be run going to be run so if i'm following are you arguing that a lot of the cruelty that we see in general in everyday life is due in part to our continued consumption of animals is that what i'm getting at? no what I am saying is that the continued consumption of animals contributes to uh, 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 to the mindset the uh, which allows for us to engage in cruelty and uh, in other forms of life, right? It's not it's not necessarily the the sole thing, and in many issues, it's not necessarily the main thing, right? But uh, what we're talking about is the creation of a mindset, and and. I, I don't think if we use other examples in history, right? I don't think people will necessarily argue, right? For example, um, you said you like extreme examples, right? Um, uh, yeah, okay, let's use extreme example then. Um, slave owners, right? Slave owners in the past, they con- helped contribute to a system of extreme casual cruelty where they bought, uh, they, they, they bought families, they broke up families, they controlled individuals' lives, right? And yet they probably didn't consider themselves necessarily uh, uh, evil or casually cruel, right? But by participating within that system, by acting in that such a way, in, in, in that way, that affected the way they, A, treated uh, uh, black, even free blacks, right? Not even mentioning their own slaves, right? It can help contribute to their political positions, et cetera. And in that same way, right, I think that ca- the casual cruelty of, uh, uh, of, of, of meat eating, right, also contributes to a sort of casual cruelty when it comes to other parts of life. I think that's, I mean, I think there is an argument for that, but I would also argue that there is a very big difference between being a slave owner, because you're not only participating consciously in a system, you're directly responsible for the evils of that system. Because when you buy a slave, you are taking that slave from where they used to be. When you put a slave to work, you're forcing that slave to work. Um, in that way, I don't think eating meat is comparable to actually killing the animal. Uh, what I mean is that if we were sort of imagine, not the same thing as, say, a, a veil of ignorance, but if you were to just put food in someone's plate, I don't think you could blame them for what they're doing. Sure, we buy stuff, so that has a repercussion in how, how many animal, animals suffer. But I still think that there is something of a disconnect. In, in, and in that sense, well, we can argue that perhaps, okay, maybe we cannot blame everyone who lived in slave-owning times. But there were people who pointed out the hypocrisy of it in, in that time. Uh, and so I do think it is entirely possible um, to argue that these people who, who own slaves and who you know, put them to work and force them to work because that is what the slave trade essentially was and what chattel slavery was, were cruel. I do think it is fair to say that. I don't think it's fair to say the same thing of carnists just because we, to an extent, participate in, an indus- in that industry. I do think that the moral character um, is very different because many people who eat meat would not be able to kill the animal themselves. Um, and so is it the fact that we eat 
animal meat an indication of how we treat uh, those who are lesser than us? A lot of people don't know. A lot of people maybe purposefully don't research the conditions in which animals are brought. A lot of people are not even really that much aware of the cruelty that goes into animal and meat consumption. And I don't think we can call those people cruel. Uh, I know, for instance, a lot of children, a lot of children are shielded from that, from their parents. Are they cruel? I don't think so. Um, I, I just don't think well, so. And so your line, oh, yeah. where I disagree with you is that your line of argument is that there is a degree of separation between individuals who are buying the uh, uh, other meat versus someone like the slave owner who is necessarily uh, uh, intrinsically participating with it. And that's fine. I don't disagree that there is a distinction between the two, right? But let's be clear. The only distinction is is degree of separation. And, uh, is, and that that fact, that distinction between the two, I don't think is, is really that meaningful di of a difference beyond uh, a potential knowledge gap, right? Like if you don't even know about these types of things, right? Then I, I don't think you're, uh, or I've never even thought about these things. Um, I'm not necessarily criticizing you. And I try to emphasize that by the fact that, by emphasizing the fact that we kind of live in, in, in an ocean of this type of thing. So you can't necessarily blame past historical figures yeah. or, or, or criticize them in, in the same way, right? Because they were not necessarily uh, 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 understanding of what they were participating with, right? So I, I, I'm trying to tell you that I recognize that there, is a, that there is a distinction. I recognize that there is a potential knowledge gap, but that doesn't change the fact that by participating with, within this system, for quite a few individuals who know that these types of things that are happening, they know that animals are being killed, but they don't care. I, I'm pretty sure every person who eats the meat, know, who eats the meat knows that an animal had to be killed, right? So at the very least at that level, they are participating within the casual cruelty that is this system. Even at Della, they might not know the whole thing. They might not know the, uh, uh, the millions of chicks which are thrown into grinders uh, every single day. They might not know that. They might not know about the enclosures which uh, these animals are, are subjected to. They might not know that. But at the very baseline, they know that these animals are being killed. And that is still a participation in terms of casual cruelty, right? Um, so... Going back to your hypothetical, um, my main problem with it is not necessarily the hypothetical itself, right? Uh, Sorry, which one? The one about uh, killing or, or freeing? Oh, well, yeah. Or freeing? Wait, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's for both of them, to be honest, right? Okay. Um, I think they're useful in terms of helping elucidate the, the particular uh, esoteric moral problems, right? At which particular thing do you care about more, right? That's fine. We can have that discussion. I love having those philosophical discussions, right? But I think it's always important to extrapolate that and to try to apply that into the real world and recognize like the, uh, the the repercussions of this, right? And I think that once we do that, I think you can, we can recognize that. Sure, in that particular circumstance, we're trying to examine which things we necessarily value more. That might be the case, but in the real world. The fact that we as individuals can't necessarily change things on the fly, I don't think it's necessarily relevant, right? I think what's relevant in the real world is trying to push forward policies which can most effectuate the change that we look for, the, the goal that we're going toward, right? So I, I don't know how useful necessarily those hypotheticals are when extrapolating to, to the real world, which is really what I care about. Um, can, sorry, can sorry. I bring in a thought experiment? I, I just, I don't want to do it if it's going to prevent you from a thought you have to respond to that. I've been trying to figure out a good point to jump in on, but I just have an interesting no, thought gonna... experiment um, with something you guys have been talking about, um, but I can wait. What do you think? No, go uh, ahead. I mean, I'll, I'll remember Prom's point. Uh, I, I think okay. I'll remember. I, it's fresh in my mind. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I'm just, uh, when I, when I moderate, I usually, um, you know, I think of it like a chess game. So I'm watching and then I'm thinking of things that aren't caught by either side. And I, I think I figured something out that would help answer each of your questions you had for each other earlier. So um, a question I have for you, Leonardo, is um, if imagine a world that's exactly like ours, but humans do not eat animals. If they killed them, 
like in the most humane way possible just for fun to remove that torture kill element which is worse hypothetical type situation if they killed them just for fun what would your stance be and then if it's what i'm guessing it would be then i think the follow-up question would be what elements are different from that world where it's exactly like ours, but humans have zero interest in eating animals. And then all the possible reasons somebody might want, no matter what, whether they're good reasons or not, what crosses over to change that acceptance of killing for fun? Do I answer? I'm just kind of throwing it out there. Hypothetical. So so your thought experiment for us. Oh, sorry. Okay, so, I, I called it sort of a thought experiment, but that is the thought experiment, I guess. Um, no, yes. And what, what I'm saying is, do off. I answer right now or do I wait for, or are you going to do the same one for prom or are you going to ask him a separate question? Do I answer now? Or do I wait for you to talk to him? Oh, sorry. So it's mostly just as you guys talked, that's something that popped into my head that felt like a thing that if somebody watched back, they might think of like, oh, elements of this. They didn't address it. If they, if they were said, then that could help. I think it would help him know where you're coming from and help his question be answered as well more thoroughly. So, um, so uh, yeah, so, so you can go ahead and respond to that if you want, and then you guys can just take it from there. Okay, so I'm going to answer to your uh, thought experiment, and then I'm going to continue with what I was going to respond to, to prompt. Yeah, okay, I figured so, there was a chance that he might have a rebuttal to your answer to the thought experiment um, that might hop in before you respond to the other thing he said. But I mean, you guys can just take it wherever you want. Okay. That's just an idea that popped in my head. We'll see. So, uh, yes, you predicted correctly. If I'm if I guess you thought that I would that I would respond that there is, in fact, a moral difference. You know, I would be against killing animals for fun. Is that what I gather? Mm -hmm. Yes, you are right. I would be against it. And uh, I think you're right. That does help elucidate my position a little bit. It has to do with character. And I think I've brought up many times my view on ethics that is mostly based on, based on virtue ethics. And the thing is, to me, like I said, there is a level of disconnect. And I suppose this does tie, in, does tie into a response to, to Brom. Um, the level of disconnect is more than a mere distance. Because the thing is, if one person stops eating meat, that doesn't necessarily lead to one less dead or suffering animal. Not necessarily, you know, market mechanisms take a while to kick in. And so to me, it's more than a degree of separation, as in physical distance. There is a change in the degree of responsibility. I do think that there is a degree because only with an aggregate of many different choices can real act be changed. That doesn't mean it's unethical or necessary to change your own individual actions. You have to start somewhere. But you're not as responsible for the greater evils of the system just by being lower down on the chain. Being lower down on the chain distributes responsibility. Uh, it is concentrated above. It is not just separation between you and killing the animal. You're directly not responsible for it. But now answering the thought experiment or tying those two things together. The thing is, because of that, the person who eats meat is a person who is essentially just overtaken by their desire to eat meat because they think it's delicious, right? And to me, that is something of an understandable flaw to have, isn't it? It is something that's very, I don't know, it's very human. It's an appetite. And the thing about it is that it does have benefits for you. Naturally, meat also has a lot of, a lot of very bad <laughs> health consequences, but it does have other positives. You know, if you don't happen to have the appropriate supplement, you may need the nutrition. Uh, it is certainly better than eating nothing. It is not better than eating a healthy plant-based diet, sure, but it is healthier than not eating and not getting any nutrition at all. However, in your example of killing animals for fun, no utility is gained at all. It is just for the sake of killing. And so, because I am concerned with character, I would think that just like uh, Brahm said, that you have to judge someone by the way that they treat their inferiors, that if you kill animals for fun, that says, that says very troubling things about you as a person. So yes, maybe the act of killing an animal isn't really any different in that world than in our world, but a world where humans don't eat animals and only ever kill them for fun, I would argue is a worse world. At the very least, it has worse humans than our world. Because our humans, they're actually quite sensitive to animals. In fact, it has been proven that showing people the conditions in which animals, uh, you know, exist in uh, prior to their deaths in the meat industry reduces the meat consumption. So to me, that shows that our humans in our world are more humane than in your hypothetical, right? Because it means we essentially only eat meat because it's delicious, not because we want to kill animals. So because I care about character, I would argue 
that there would be a moral difference between those two worlds. And I do think that in your hypothetical, people would be worse. Killing something just for the sake of it is an act of cruelty in a way that eating meat at a supermarket just isn't. Because firstly, you're not killing the animal. And second, it's purely utilitarian to you. You just want to eat something delicious, and it just so happens that it has repercussions that lead to the death of an animal. And they lead to the death of an animal in the future because the animal that you bought and ate, that's already dead. It has repercussions only in the way that a market mechanism, you know, it takes your input, it takes your money, and then it decides to kill an animal. But you didn't kill anything. You're, well, you kind of contributed to, a, to an, an aggregate of decisions that will result in the death of something, but you don't kill it by eating. At that point, it's already dead. However, if you kill animals for fun, you're taking the light in the cessation of perception. And while I don't think that's the main, as I've established, I don't think that's the main uh, consideration of, uh, of morality. I do, I do think it factors in, and I do think it's, it's wantonly cruel in a way that just eating meat isn't. Um, killing for fun is, is something else, and it says troubling things about the person in a way that just giving in to a, a desire to eat, it just doesn't. One thing is a lot more inhumane than the other. That's what I believe. Um, I guess my main problem with this is that I, I see the distinction, but I, I don't really know how much it matters. Right. Um, you may make the claim like you may claim that there is a distinction. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, look, if you kill someone yourself versus if you pay for someone to kill someone else for you, there is a difference there. Right. Um, like there is a distinction there. But in both. But I don't necessarily care about this, this, this distinction. What I'm pointing out is that in both instances, A, the end result is the same. And B, that is something that you actively contributed to. Right. So the fact that you're actively contributing to it is something that can stop. And that's what I'm advocating for. Right. So yeah. like the moral, uh, 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 the moral imposition upon an individual, whether or not they're like uh, they're evil in the same way. I don't necessarily really care about that on the individual level. Right. Because it's really, really hard to tell what, whether or not somebody is evil on the aggregate, et cetera. Right. What I care about is whether or not an individual is contributing to a cruel system, right? So that's that's my main point with regards to that. The question that I ask you with regards to like the, the distinction um, between an individual who kills animals for fun versus like someone in, 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 with a degree of, of separation, I mean, I would ask you: there isn't any utility gained in killing an animal for fun. The utility is the joy that you get from killing the animal. Right, like the joy that I hear when torturing that animal, hearing it squeal in pain, ah, uh, like it's ah, uh, it's it's beautiful, right? Yeah. In the same way that somebody might have a conversation about the taste of uh, 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 of me, right? Oh wow, the absolute juiciness of it! I loved it. I love I loved this animal's flesh that I just consumed. Right? They are complimenting. They are enjoying the uh, 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 the an animal which their actions. Their continued uh, uh, provision of financial capital helps create, right? In the same way that their actions, which is, uh, 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 you know, the stabbing of the animal themselves, right? The stabbing of the animals, they are contributing toward that end result. In the same way, their provision of capital is contributing to that end result. And in both cases, a sensory pleasure is being satisfied. In one, it's, you know, the, um, the, uh, the taste the taste buds eating the animal, and the other one is the sound or the feeling that you get when you hear the uh, pig squeal as you, like, you know, I don't know, step on it, right? So yes. I, I recognize that there is a distinction, but the point that I'm trying to make is that these, uh, uh, that, that distinction is just a degree of separation, and do we really care that much about degree of separation in other aspects of life, right? Like, if there's degrees of separation for a product that you get that's a result of child labor, Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, and you know that, you know, that your capital, the, the thing you're buying, right, is going to go toward helping fund child labor. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a distinction between that and you necessarily uh, 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 actively paying for child labor. Right. I do think there's a distinction, but is it really that big of a distinction? I don't think so. I think that the, the only reason we try to claim that there is a distinction is because it makes us uncomfortable that we live in a world where we are contributing or participating within systems that are wantonly cruel from you know the, our supply system, which, which relies on child labor, 
uh, to some extent with for some products, right? To our continued uh, 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 financing of a uh, uh, of a meat eating system, which causes and contributes to the deaths and sufferings of countless animals, right? There's a distinction, but we overemphasize a degree of separation as a meaningful distinction. It's it, it is one, but not as large of a difference as people try to make it out to be. Can I can I answer? Yeah, go ahead, man. Okay. So uh, you're right about one thing, and I, I do apologize uh, that I made a grave mistake in arguing that there is no utility in killing animals for fun. Please don't take that out of context, but you know what I mean in that hypothetical. Uh, Ooh, yes, you're absolutely right. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, you're, the thing that I should have said is that I would judge that utility much more harshly than the other for just one simple reason. If all meat eaters could eat meat that didn't come from a dead animal, if we had, I don't know, like meat mines where you could mine meat or you have you could grow meat on crops, do you think that a meat eater would get the same utility in the flavor of the meat than they would if that animal had been killed? I'm a little it was just as delicious. Question. I'm a little confused. Though. So are you asking if there were alternatives to meat which were just, just as delicious? Um, exactly. But then they told but then they chose to do the uh, the um, original way instead. Is no, that no, no. I'm just asking if if you could have a meat eater and you could have okay. Uh, so one of these two comes from a dead animal and the other is completely artificial, but they both taste the same. What do you think would happen? What, what would the meat eater I... do? Um, and and they cost the same. To be clear, yeah, they cost the same. Or in this hypothetical, they don't have to buy it. You just put it on the table, and which one do they like? Oh, uh, I think that most likely they would prefer the uh, one which did not, which was like you know lab. Uh, uh, I was about to say that they would prefer the one that is lab grown. Well, l let me take a second. Um, yeah. L l for the purpose of this hypothetical, because I know what you're going for, and I actually agree. Yeah. Right. For the purpose of this hypothetical, let's exclude things like you know, you know like people who, who are anti. GMO, yeah, afraid of like GMOs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For the, so I get what you're going for. So let's exclude that. And I would argue that, yes, absolutely, they would prefer the one which was um, created by the uh, labs, well, but by the labs with, with, without yeah. contributing to the harms of people. And I think that yeah. actually contributes to my argument. Yes. My argument is that most people's moral systems cohere with veganism, right? But because they enjoy the sensory pleasure of consuming these animals, right? They decide to ignore it. They decide not to focus on it. They decide to place an, an overemphasis on the degree of separation, despite the fact that we don't really place that same level of, uh, uh, of emphasis on degree of separation to other cruel systems, right? Yes. So, yeah, so go on. But the reason I bring it up is that this is to me why there is a distinction between the utility gained by killing an animal for pleasure and between, uh, you know, eating an animal. This is why I do believe there is an importance in that degree of separation. Because for one, the pain of the animal doesn't factor into the pleasure. You don't need to have your animal tortured for it to taste delicious and, you know, want it. Nobody wants that, not necessarily, not explicitly. And I do think that there is a difference between, you know, the hypothetical of killing an animal for fun and like you would argue, you know, uh, you know, the pleasure of hearing, hearing them squirm and scream and whatever. I do think that that is relevant for the simple reason that I believe we as a society should encourage good character. Because the fact that you're going to make maybe, you know, maybe you're a vegetarian, but if you're a vegetarian for very selfish reasons, you know, maybe somebody told you that it's just, I don't know, it's just for your own health or you'll be wealthier if you're a vegan or something. Sure, you might have a temporary positive effect on the planet by not eating, eating any meat, but in other political situations, that vegan would be a terrible person. You know, just as an example, and I'm not, uh, I'm sorry that a lot of arguments have to um, have to uh, <laughs> lead uh, here. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm um, confused with it, to be honest. Yes, uh, no, what I'm, sorry, yeah. what? I, I'm a little confused. Like, I'm going to ask the question, I'll let you speak, because I know I've spoken a lot, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, go for sorry, it. Sorry, just, just go. Yeah. Um, what I don't understand is why is it bad character to consume meat for taste pleasure, but it's bad character to kill or to, or to torture for hearing pleasure? 
Oh, because one of those is more easily fixed than the other. Uh, a society where people like to, I don't know, um, like to eat meat because uh, it tastes delicious, even though it, it comes from a very cool place, that product. Like I said, we have studies that show that if you show people how animals are treated, they will reduce their meat consumption. These are people who fundamentally, when shown the consequences of their actions, like you said, they will align with your own, with a, with a more ethical uh, set of actions. You know, that's, that's what you said, and I agree with you. However, a person who kills for fun, they won't be dissuaded by it. You show them the consequences of their actions, they might want to do it more. One of those is a set of people that you can build a workable society around. The other isn't. That is my point. So cultivating one type of character is better than the other because one of those, like you yourself said, is more congruent with ultimately a vegan lifestyle. Even if people, you know, like eating meat and they think it's delicious, you show them the consequences of their actions and they reduce their meat consumption. We have studies which prove it, which means that to me, their moral character is better than a person who kills for fun. Because if you do the same thing, you show them, oh, this is how animals are treated. They might think it's fun. They might say, oh, okay, I'm gonna, if it leads to more animal suffering, but I need more meat. So um, this, is, this is actually where like, this is odd because we've, we've kind of flipped positions a little bit, but uh, <laughs> uh, this, I actually disagree with you, right? Um, I think that the, the distinction that you're drawing between these two types of individuals exists and it's irrelevant for the question of which one can you more easily convince for uh, 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 limiting animal suffering, right? I would agree with you that the individual who you can show the, 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 the picture of the consequences of their own actions, right? They are more likely to change to someone who wants to reduce animal suffering, while the second person will not, right? Where I right. disagree with you is your statement that one in uh, uh, that these that these two individuals are in any way distinct in terms of their ability to uh, 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 be a part a working part of society, right? It's perfectly possible for both of these people individuals to exist within a perfectly coherent society, right? It's happened throughout history, right? So it's not so it's it's not necessary for society. It might be necessary for trying to limit animal suffering, but I like that. That's that's not like the point you made. Maybe you can restate that. Uh, I'll I'll give you the floor or restate it if you need to. No, I actually I actually quite think that that, that stands because I would argue that societies that are so inherently cruel are not ultimately consistent and ultimately destroy themselves. I don't think that those societies are actually fully coherent. I would think that if we were to I don't know take a hypothetical period in Germany from 1939 to 1945. I don't think that that would be a sustainable society. Yes, they could rationalize their cruelty, but that doesn't mean that they were actually, you know, heading to a good direction. Uh, you know, I believe that societies that are cruel tend to destroy themselves as a consequence of their own actions. So I, I would actually argue that, no, I, I would actually, my point stands, I would argue that societies that are so self-contradictory, and, and, and I call them self-contradictory because presumably people who enjoy kill, killing certain animals for fun don't enjoy doing it the same to other people. Um, you know, if they do, there is some kind of a contradiction there because maybe, okay, I want to kill strangers for fun, but not my own family members. And we can clearly see how that would not lead to a good society because, you know, laws would be different depending on the person and, and things would get out of hand very quickly. Uh, so, no, I actually don't think that, that it is possible for people with such bad character to form coherent society because, sure, maybe they only like killing animals. What if they don't? You know, what if these people just treat anyone who's beneath them that way? What if they torture other humans? What if they torture other people? What if they torture their own children? You know, well, I, I, I don't think now, it's possible. Now you're adding them. additional variables, right? Those additional, <laughs> you're, you're, you're making the assumption that because an, an individual enjoys hearing the torture of animals, that they necessarily enjoy, uh, that necessarily expands to other things, et cetera, right? And what I'm trying to emphasize is this particular variable. And this particular variable has existed throughout a uh, 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 societies everywhere right like like animal welfare is something that is relatively new in terms of like the, the scope and the depth that we have it now and the reason for that is because animals can't really advocate for their welfare right so yes. in the way that humans could have so these type of people who who've enjoyed animal suffering have existed and have continued to exist in, in societies all throughout the world right and the societies haven't collapsed as a result of it right so True. what I, what I, what I would agree with you is the larger point, which is that a society of casual cruelty cannot continue to 
uh, it's, it's difficult for it to continue to exist because there is going to be repercussions to it, right? Mm-hmm. But I think that only really applies to people or things which can advocate for themselves, right? Like if you're doing it or, or, or respond in a violent manner, right, to other humans essentially. But with regards to animals, they simply don't have the capability to do that. They don't have the capability to advocate for themselves. They don't have the uh, capability to uh, advocate peacefully. They don't really have the capability to respond violently, right? They are a population which is entirely uh, um, unable- Disenfranchised. Yeah, they're disenfranchised, right? So I think it is entirely possible to continue to have a society where these type of people exist because the people who would really cause waves the uh the the animals that really cause waves they can't do anything yeah maybe uh, but i'm not necessarily arguing that the mere presence of cruel people causes societies to collapse what i'm arguing is in the hypothetical in the thought experiment of carson in which that is the majority of the people that is how humans work generally um no yeah of course naturally individuals who are this cruel exist in society all the time but they themselves seem to be quite misfits you know uh like, it's, like I said, you know, going back to the example here in Chile, people who are torturers are often very damaged people. They are not functional human beings. Uh, killing or torturing small animals is sometimes an indicator of some forms of psychopathy. People who eventually, you know, they tend to commit a lot of crimes and sometimes they fit in society in very predatory roles, but sometimes they get caught and sometimes they don't, they don't fit into society neatly. So yes, you're absolutely right that cool people can exist in society and society won't collapse. But I do think these are not functional humans. You can make a society just out of these people. You know, psychopaths only have the power they have because they live in a world where other people are not psychopaths. You know, a manipulator only succeeds because they have people to manipulate. You cannot make a society of all manipulators. So what I'm saying is that, yes, it is true that eating, choosing to eat meat just because it's delicious is a bit unethical. I do agree with you there. That's why I I reduce meat consumption myself. Um, But the people who do that, although flawed, are ultimately human beings that you can make a society out of. However, people who kill for joy, I don't think you could. I don't think that they would make a functioning society if it was only them. Whereas if it was only flawed uh, carnists, we could. That society wouldn't be perfect. We wouldn't be perfect, but we could make it work somewhere. Uh, I don't think we could do the same for the other. And that is why I emphasize this difference so much, which I'm sorry it's taken me so long to, to state it because it's one of your main questions. But that is why I think there is a big difference between, uh, there is an importance to character. Because ultimately, character, to me, is what determines how easily a person will be swayed by arguments as well. Um, And so this is why I think it's important that we establish a degree of separation. Sometimes when we make people feel too guilty, they stop listening, precisely because, as you said, they feel uncomfortable. And when they're faced with that kind of cognitive dissonance, well, they don't really listen. So I do think that we have to it is relevant to the discussion of veganism that we that we establish differences between different characters of people. Uh, it, it is it is relevant that we emphasize a degree of separation. It is relevant that we tell people, okay, you're not the same thing as a torturer. You're not the same thing as a murderer. All we're asking is that you eat less of this. This way, to me, the environmental argument is more potent because it doesn't make people feel guilty in the same way. It doesn't make them feel like they're bad people. It makes them feel like, oh, well, I didn't know that. I didn't know. Okay, so I can just, maybe I can, and move down the, the, the chart of, of uh, uh, foods that produce a lot of, of, of emissions. Or maybe I'll, I'll drop off a beef, maybe I'll drop off lamb, and maybe I can go down the list. Whereas if you tell them meat is murder, people tend to close their ears. And so the thing is, you're right that at the end of the day, the important thing about ethics is that it has to be applied to the real world. But unlike you, I do believe that degrees of separation play a role in them because it, it serves a rhetorical function. If you call someone flawed versus if you call them a murderer, you know, these are very different things. And I'm not saying that you call carnists murderers. You, you certainly haven't even though I eat meat. Um, but precisely what I'm arguing is that the reason it would be a bad idea to, you know, if, if, if you had come into this conversation and screamed murder at me because I'm in the anti-vegan position, we would not be having this conversation, right? Uh, I, I think it's only possible that we uh, talk to each other because you recognize that that degree of separation is different. If, if Carson had told you this person is an anti-vegan, if Carson had told you, uh, I'm going to bring, you know, a, a famous torturer, he has killed thousands of people, would you be so calm talking to me? I, I don't think you would. So I think that reveals that the degree of separation is relevant because when we judge people, we do it based primor- primarily on their character, not just on the general consequences of their actions because no one knows the full extent 
of the consequences of their actions. We judge them based on their character. And that is why I believe the degree of separation is relevant. Because when we're get, trying to convince people to reduce meat consumption, we have to appeal to things that they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't reject out of the gate. Uh, we have to appeal to things that are persuasive. And we can't really do that if we don't empathize with them. And it's much easier to empathize with a carnist than to empathize with a torturer or a murderer, isn't it? And so to me, it does serve a very practical function to emphasize the degree of separation. It makes it so that some people can be talked to and some people cannot be talked to. It makes it so that some people can be convinced and other people cannot be convinced. I would argue that that is absolutely relevant to, to how we implement uh, you know, a reduction in meat con consumption all across the board. Uh, how we reduce animal suffering, how we save the planet. I think that that is extremely relevant. So, so yes, I agree with you broadly on like the substance of the argument, but I would add that actually it is necessary for your own point that we emphasize the degree of separation. Otherwise, people are not going to listen. That's, so, that's what I believe. I, no, I actually agree with you on this in the sense that, I, but I think we need to draw a distinction. Mm -hmm. I think we need to draw a distinction between what is more efficacious, what is more rhetorically effective versus right. whether or not there's a, uh, 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 versus like the moral analysis, right? So when we have a discussion regarding moral analysis, regarding degree of separation, right. I think that, th that there is a distinction, and I emphasized this previously, that there is a distinction but, uh, that the degree of separation causes, and that distinction is the knowledge gap. An individual m just might not know the specifics involved with right. uh, 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 th th these deaths, and therefore, that knowledge gap can have an effect in terms of, you know, uh, 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 their moral calculus. Right. And, and, and that's fine, right? Kind of has to. But, sure, but that, that is the main distinction. Yeah. And that is, a, and it's an important one, but I would still argue, and this is the, the line of argument, right? That every, v, every individual who consumes me, there is no knowledge gap when it comes to the death of the animal. Right, they know that right. the animal yes. is going to you, die. You're right about that. Exactly, they know that animal is going to die, and they're fine with it. They don't know about all the torture that happens, right? But they know that the animal is going to die. But it's it's in an abstraction, so to speak, right? So that combination yes. of it being an abstract thing versus the knowledge gap makes it so that the degree of separation is relevant, right? In terms of uh, uh, your uh, ability, it is relevant, but it's not relevant in the moral dimension. Which is like judging judging them as individuals because right. I don't care about judging them as individuals. It's impossible for me to do that, right? It's it's not even relevant. Where it's relevant is in terms of rhetorical effectiveness, Rhetoric, yeah. and that goes to the pragmatic element, right? So you you seem to be concerned with whether or not uh, in the moral analysis, right? Um, uh, uh, you want you want for me to emphasize the. Uh, degree of separation because you're concerned it, you, it would it will result in me saying oh you're a terrible individual akin to torturers right and you're worried about that and i'm telling you that's not what i care about because i don't care about attempting to uh identify who is a good or bad person right what i care about is whether or not an or action reaction. yeah whether or not an action contributes to an overall cruel system right now when it yeah. comes to when it comes to rhetorical effectiveness, I actually agree with that, right? I think that when you're having a conversation with someone, it, you have to have the you have to talk to them, and you have to see where they're initially coming from. If they are more concer uh, concerned with the environment, right, then talk to them about that, right? Because there, there's an argument there. If they're more concerned about like diseases, etc., talk to them about uh, about environment uh, about veganism there. If they're concerned about the, the moral implications. They care about animals, right? Talk about talk about it through through that avenue. That's why I think. Evrenism is so effective, right? But what I, but what I have to push back against is the consistent attempt to draw a larger than exists distinction between an individual who provides financial capital and actually participates within a system, helping mm -hmm. that system function, versus an individual who the executioner, the executioner, right? There is a distinction. But it's not that large as people try to make it seem. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I I see where you're coming from. Um, so right. I th there's actually a couple of things you've mentioned quite a few times before, and I'm, 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 I really hope you're not annoyed that I haven't responded to them. I sort of forgot. It's fine. Go for it, man. Uh, I know I talk a lot, dude. It's all yours. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. It's all right. But I, sh I should have because I, I thought of a response when I first heard it, and and then I, I I sort of forgot, and so I 
I, I suppose I must be a bit frustrated. Yes, you're absolutely right. As something that I completely, completely forgot to mention was what you said about you always know that you're killing an animal. Yes, I would argue that that is relevant, but I would still consider it less relevant because if you follow the rest of my argument, the death is actually kind of the least part of it. You know, animals kill each other all the time in a way that they don't necessarily torture each other all the time. Naturally, yes, some some deaths are more cool than others in the animal kingdom. Um, but yeah, um, in, in general, I, I do think you're right. But I think there is quite a big moral gap between killing and subjecting something to undescribable amounts of torture. I think those are very different things. Uh, I don't think, yes, it is entirely possible that, um, that, that we can try and make some some comparison between people oh you know people know that they're killing an animal because when they eat it it's already dead so they have to know what you know we, we can't just tell we can just say oh they didn't know what they were doing no no of course when you eat a piece of an animal you know that that animal is dead you're right about that uh, but like i said predation is something that's rather natural between species so uh, I, I would not argue that that is something that makes someone you know yes it is not a knowledge gap that is true uh, but the morality of it is more up for debate than the torture. You know, I think Wait, torturing but... something is never okay, uh, whereas we can make exceptions for killing in cases of self-defense, nutrition, predation. Uh, if it was your only chance you, to have any food, I think we would all agree it would be okay to kill an animal and eat it then if, if Wait, we didn't have to get something, nat- right? Isn't this like sort of like the naturalistic fallacy where something is, is seen as good because it's natural right there are plenty of things plenty of things that are natural that exist like uh, uh that, that non-human animals do that we find unethical right they steal they right. rape they eat their children they uh, uh, uh but we don't actually follow that and but yeah. look but but, but let, let's assume that like we just i accept your argument on its face that hey um it's natural right well okay why do why do we follow necessarily the um the the natural uh inclinations of I don't know, like a shark or a cheetah, right? Which which are uh, um, meat eaters. Why don't we follow something like you know the hip, not, not the, the hippopotamus or the ox or giraffe? We are omnivores, right? So we could have the capability of choosing between those two, and still be able to leave uh, lead perfectly fine and, and 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 good lives, right? But so like, I I don't really buy the naturalistic argument, it, it because one. Okay. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. No, yeah, yeah. I, I think. Did you have I mean, another one? You, you said you had like multiple points that you, you were reminded of. Oh yes, uh, I was going somewhere else, but I, I, I suppose I, I can answer that the naturalist uh, point a little bit. Yes, I'm not, I'm not arguing necessarily that the most natural thing is simultaneously the most good thing, uh, but I do think that in general there are places where you can't ignore nature. You know. Um, because we are still animals driven by instinct. We don't have to do everything that our instincts say that would be that would be madness. Uh, but our reason is part of our nature too. So all I'm saying is that we're not necessarily having to follow the, the predacious a- a- habits of other animals. We certainly can. We don't have the fangs or the claws to do it. Uh, but what I am saying is that just like a tiger will do what it is in accordance to its own nature, that perhaps predation could be interpreted to be part of what a human is. What I'm trying to argue is that there is still a knowledge gap, even if you know you're killing the animal, because you can know you're killing the animal, but you might not know that it's wrong. And you can't really know it since morality is subjective. Uh, but what I am arguing is that even in your example, the, the knowledge gap is still at play because, yes, a person might know they're killing an animal, but they might not have the means to articulate why it's wrong. And so to me, that still somewhat absolves them of something. Yes, they know they're killing something, but they don't have to recognize that as wrong. Wait, you know, but that will only be relevant if we care about trying to evaluate this individual and whether or not they're like a good or bad person, right? It's oh, absolutely- yes. This is just in response to what you said about uh, there not being a knowledge gap between uh, uh, between killing an animal and uh, the, the point that you brought up, right? That, that there is no knowledge gap for sure, killing but, an animal because you always but, know. That's just sure, a response but, to that. Sure, but my, but my claim with regards to the knowledge gap, right, has simply to do with the fact that they, they know they're killing the animal. Right, and mm-hmm. they're contributing to something that I would claim is a cruel system. It, there's absolutely like the, the the their knowledge gap, uh, the knowledge gap with regards to the morality of the question, is in my opinion, it's like a nonsensical one, considering the fact that morality is subjective. Right, so there can't be a knowledge gap with regards to a subjective question. Right, um, it's just that we 
there is no knowledge gap when it comes to the outcome of that particular action. And, and given the fact that I consider that action to be uh, uh, eminently cruel, mm-hmm. that that is something that I won't solve. That is a problem that uh, uh, I want prevented, right? So I don't really think there is a knowledge gap when it, uh, when it comes to the morality of the subject, because that's fundamentally subjective. You can't have like a knowledge gap, so to speak, about it. Yeah, I, I suppose you're right. But for instance, if you didn't know that animals were sentient to the extent that we know it today, like think of what Descartes said about animals who believed they were basically just automata, um, there would be a knowledge gap there, wouldn't it? Because we don't extend the same protection to animal rights as we do bacteria rights, right? We don't consider that something worthy of rights. And, and, and I suppose you don't. Um, there are living things too small to care about, right? I'm not entirely sure why this is irrelevant. Because of well, the fact, yes. uh, yeah, I'm sorry. a little confused. No, uh, what, what I mean is that, yeah, you're right that there is no knowledge gap in terms of subjective matters. But your opinion can change based on what you know, right? There is no objective truth to whether or not um, killing an animal is right or wrong. We cannot really prove it beyond this, the subject. Uh, sure. But we, it is more likely that if you don't know that an animal is sentient, well, someone who doesn't believe animals are sentient is more likely to have no problem with their death versus someone who knows that animals are sentient. Yes, so yes can, you're I, I right that, that technically there is no knowledge gap in subjective questions, but subjective answers can be influenced by knowledge. And so there is a knowledge gap there. If you don't know that an animal is sentient, well, the implications of killing it are obviously less than if you do know that the animal is sentient. So I do think that a knowledge gap can apply to subjective, subjective questions anyway. That, that that's what I believe. Um, yeah, I don't actually follow, right? Because you're you're talking about the fact that hey, you may have a knowledge gap with regards to sentience, and that might uh, affect your moral decision making, right? Yes. Um, but once again, that's just a question of what is your sense of morality on that particular subject. You have to like learn about particular things and that might change your uh, opinion. But if we have that line of belief, that line of argument, right? That like you might receive some future line of information that might ch- change your belief on the subject, right? Then we can't really morally judge anyone about anything, right? Like like uh, uh, they're, because they, they always might have some piece of information they might be missing, right? And I think that's, that's, that's practically useless. Uh, and I, the reason why I think it's practically useless is that if you have that line of argument, then you are essentially morally paralyzed. Maybe, but I think that the true measure of how we interact with other people isn't by moral judgments, it's by physical action. You know, uh, kind of the, 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 the consequence of my moral framework as I exposed it is to educate people. You know, that's what I believe we should do in regards to climate change, for instance. Uh, Wait, I, I don't think that's morally paralyzing. Confused. Yeah, I'm a little confused, Leonard, right? Yeah. Um, because I think we both share like a sense of analysis in the sense that what we care is the actions, the outcomes, right? Yeah. That is something that, that we emphasize. But it feels like every time I, I emphasize, I say, hey, look, I don't necessarily care about uh, 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 um, the whether or not you your line of reasoning coming to this conclusion, right, is whether or not you would consider it a good person, because I think that morality is fundamentally subjective, right? Each time I say that, you seem to go toward the idea that, hey, these individuals, they might not know this thing and this thing, and therefore they might not be as morally bad. And that that line of argument is a line of argument that has to do with whether or not somebody is considered a bad person. And that's not something I care about, because morality is fundamentally subjective, what I care about is that, hey, this is a thing that we, uh, uh, that I think is morally uh, uh, abhorrent, and and you are contributing to that through your actions, whether or not you don't, whether or not you you know the full extent of or every line of argument about this particular subject is irrelevant to to, to that, because uh, uh, because I don't care about that necessarily. That's not relevant to my analysis, to my advocacy. It might be relevant in terms of like what would be most rhetorically effective. But it's not relevant in the sense that these that there is no knowledge gap when it comes to them knowing that this animal is dead. Okay, so I there's a couple of points I mentioned I was going to bring up earlier, but I'm going to try to address the, those first, and I'm going to move on to the other ones uh, next. Uh, I mean, yes, you're kind of right, but the thing is, just like you believe there's something of an artificial distinction 
um, well, not necessarily artificial, but you think that there is an overstated um, distance between uh, eating an animal and killing it. I think you're sort of overstating the difference between those two forms of analysis, between the form that takes the, the form of judgment of a person and that which takes the form of action. I think those are continuums. Again, that is due to my moral framework. Because I am a virtue ethicist, to me, someone's character is the highest predictor of their actions. That is why I care whether or not people are good or bad. Uh, because I believe people act in accordance to their character. That is not an immutable thing, mind you. I'm not arguing for some kind of essentialism here. Um, but I do believe that people are informed primarily in their actions by their own character. Because of that, I kind of have to care about whether or not someone is a good person if I care about actions. Because someone who is, say, raised to be a good person, we can predict that their actions will tend to have a positive effect. Again, as long as they know some consequences, right? As long as someone has a good character and some information, we can expect that those two things will come together and produce good actions. If you're someone who is, say, kind and knows the consequences of their actions, you, we can expect that that person will behave kindly to others. Whereas if someone is cruel and they know something, they'll probably act very crudely, right? But this like when someone is kind, but they don't know the consequences of their actions, then you can't really predict good actions either, right? That but, is but why I care about whether or not people are, are good or bad. I don't see that as a separate discussion from their actions. I see that as a continuum. We have to understand how people work if we are to predict their actions. That, that's why I believe the question actually is relevant to, but, the, to the matter of actions. But, that would, but this uh, lens of analysis, when you're examining their uh, character, their set of beliefs as a predictor of their future actions, right? Mm -hmm. Is, in my opinion, and this is maybe maybe my frame of reference, that is within the realm of practical analysis, right? Where you're trying to find, okay, what is their character? What is the best way to convince them? What is, uh, 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 and, and, and how can we predict their future actions? That is the lens of practical analysis, right? And you do it through, uh, 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 because, we're, because we're unable to really identify and fully encapsulate someone's character, you have to do it through abbreviations, through approximations, right? And that's like the practical lens of analysis. That's a practical re realm of analysis, right? That's one yeah. thing, but there's it. I think it's separate from the moral dimension, the moral analysis, where things are a lot more clear, a lot more uh, uh, clear cut, right? Um, when you are engaging in the moral dimension or the moral uh, a moral analysis, I don't necessarily care about your uh, uh 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 your your character your your character because i don't necessarily care about your uh, about about your indications for future actions right what i'm doing here is i'm trying to evaluate whether or not those particular actions are within the moral system that i've set up good or bad which is to say they lead to good consequences or bad consequences right that is that is your framework, bro. Yes, I, I am. You. Oh yeah, maybe we should have specified that earlier. Yes, uh, I, I suppose maybe then we can move up to another subject because I think that this would be interesting for another conversation where we specifically discuss moral systems, right? That that would be interesting maybe. If I am on the side of virtue ethics and you're on the side of rule utilitarianism, sorry, sure. stoicism, because virtue ethics is more broad. You're broadly a consequentialist, but specifically a rule utilitarian. Uh, yes, uh, but that sort of explains why we disagree, doesn't it? To me, yeah, character is time. part of the moral dimension. Uh, <laughs> there's very little that can be done to to change that because, in my mind, that is morals. Um, character is morals, um, not necessarily rule rule utilitarianism. Um, so I, I think that's actually better for another discussion. So I now agree. I'm going to move on to to other I, things, if you don't mind. Okay, if I can just say one thing, I'll let you go. Yeah. Um, yeah so rule utilitarianism essentially it moves forward or, or, or it engages in analysis of, of particular rules, which we think can result in, in positive consequences for society, right? The consequences yes. are what matters. And that's why I don't necessarily care about the individual actor's predilections, right? Um, and the, and, and, but when it comes to the, the practical advocacy analysis, right? The character does matter from a rhetorical perspective in order to help best convince them, right? So like, that's why I personally try to draw a distinction, but I understand why you as a virtue ethicist or a, a stoicist um, uh, would believe otherwise. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think that that's fair. I think it would be very interesting actually to argue with you on other topics of morality. Um, but I suppose if, you know, in the interest of time, I think we should keep it focused on veganism for now. Um, but I don't know if you're afraid, 
that, that would be really interesting. Yeah, we so, should definitely um, set that up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the other point that I was going to, to bring up is that I also think that your participation in a cool system has to be evaluated in relation to what you know, because the solution to that system might be different. Um, like, for instance, would you argue that the slave labor uh, that exists today, not, not the chattel slavery of, of yesteryear, but the slave labor that exists today and animal consumption, would you, consumption, sorry, not consumption, and animal consumption, would you argue that these are morally equivalent, like the solution that works for one would work for the other? Wait, before I answer that, I, I'm just a little bit confused. So you said your participation within a corrupt system should be evaluated, but evaluated within what context? I'm a little confused. Evaluated within the context of like whether or not you're a good person? Because if that's the case, I don't really care about it, right? Like, like what do you mean exactly? But what I mean is that before you said uh, something along the lines of, let me see, like, when we were talking about probably degree of separation uh, you argue that there was more of an equivalency or that the, you know the, that in general we have a duty not to participate or not to engage in in morally corrupt systems um something uh, something along those uh, lines if i if i don't recall yeah i i think i said that people tend to over, over uh, well, while there is a distinction between the two when it comes to degree of separation those distinctions mm -hmm. being uh, knowledge gap as well as the fact that when it's, there's a decrease of separation there's a level of emotional abstraction right um, while I agree that there are those distinctions, those distinctions are, are, are overemphasized, and those distinctions don't, don't mean that you don't have a duty to uh, uh, not engage in those activities. Oh, yeah. So based on that, that, that's why I ask you that question. Would you argue that the, what works as a solution to the cruelty of animal consumption, which is to not eat meat, would work the same for modern slave labor? Like if we, if we stop consuming any object that used slave labor? Would the problem be fixed? Um, hmm. Well, to be clear, my solutions with regards to uh, the meat industry aren't like they're a lot more multifaceted than just stop eating meat, right? There needs to also be legislative advocacy. There needs to be, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. There, there, there needs to be pushed toward a an equitable transition for the animals, right? Because you, you can't just like l let them all out and like free grazing and then destroy the crops, etc. Destroy people like, livelihoods. You know, destroy uh, uh, the the environmental uh, life cycles of those particular areas. So it's a lot more multi multifaceted with regards to veganism, and I would also argue that with regards to um, dealing with slave labor, it also is multifaceted. Obviously, we should prevent these these types of things from happening, right? But I also think, well, we think we need to recognize that if you do prevent these types of things from happening. These individuals, they're still getting some amount of money from these interactions, even though it's incredibly minimal, right? So we need to ensure an equitable transition for these individuals to make sure that we don't just simply remove their like one of their few areas of substance, substance. But we also provide them with alternatives, uh, which can make it so that they're able to like live fruitful lives. And at the same time, we need to be able to facilitate the creation of alternatives uh, for uh, 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 of alternative supply chains for people, so that we can get. Uh, these goods that we previously got at relatively cheap prices, right? Um, at similar prices, or even if it's a little bit more expensive, we found all alter alternate ways to subsidize to make it so that it's relatively the same. So like, it's a complicated question, but I, all I would say is that simply not doing it is a simplistic analysis of the things that we need to do. It's very much multifaceted. Yes, and I agree with you fully. But likewise, I do think that there is a, a significant asymmetry between these two cases, because I do think that not eating meat or reducing our meat consumption by a substantial amount would do more for veganism than just stop, you know, buying computers or other products bought from, a, you know, a cobalt mines or something. Um, in, in that sense, I do believe that one is more simplistic than the other. And it's part of the reason why I do emphasize that the individual's relationship to the uh, to the corrupt system has to be emphasized, has to be taken into account, because the consequences of participating in a corrupt system, even if both systems are exploitative, even if we consider both slave labor and uh, the animal, the meat industry to be exploitative, they're exploitative in different ways. You know, animals don't need jobs; they don't need to be part of the meat industry. They're not forced by economic reasons; they're forced by force, uh, whether whether it's humans 
are actually forced by economic reasons to accept jobs that are essentially slavery. And so the reason I bring that up, again, this would be better fitted to another discussion, so it's not going to be a very in-depth explanation. Uh, but that is also part of the reason why I do think it's relevant that we take into account a person's character, because the very consequences of participating in a corrupt system depend on what an individual likes or dislikes. If you eat more meat than, say, um, buy products that are of, of, of slave origin, the solutions that you need to take into your own life would be different than other ones. And perhaps as a more as a closing statement, because I, I'm not sure, not a closing statement, I, you still have to say your, your piece, but um, I'm not sure how much more we can get closer to each other, because at the end of the day, I think we agree on the basic, right? I, th I think we were both for a, a, a general reduction in uh, uh, a general reduction in meat consumption, right? And, uh, and I'm really sorry that this last argument I made is not clear at all. I would really wish to expand on it further. Uh, but again, it's, I think it's better suited to a discussion about slave trade than it would be about uh, veganism. So uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry if I left you more confused with that explanation, which is a, seems to be a pattern. I promise it's I'll fine. get better. It's fine. I'll, uh, I, I probably did the same. Um, I'll, I'll leave my line of argument with this. Okay. I, think, I, I think that veganism is a sort of moral philosophy which coheres with quite a few individuals' moral systems, but they don't follow it for various reasons. They don't follow it either because they don't really know much about it or they, have, yeah, they, they, they just become so used to uh, consuming meat that like it's just a common part of their life. There may be cultural ties to it, et cetera. Um, but, and, and, and I recognize that. And so I don't necessarily judge them for it because A, I don't necessarily care about judging people. I care about solving the problem. And two, I recognize that an individual who is uh, uh, lost in a, a sea of, of cultural influence, it, it's difficult for them to break out of those chains, right? Um, what I am interested in doing personally is trying to push forward toward a day where, where for whatever reason you have for becoming re vegan, whether or not, whether it be environmental reasons, whether it be for disease reasons, whether it be for moral reasons, right? That we that eventually we can come to the point where we look back upon the uh, uh, the killing of millions of animals consistently every single year, the torturous conditions that we put them under, and and I'm hoping that one day we look back upon my past self who engaged in these types of activities. And we look back up upon all the people who engaged in these types of activities and said, wow, they were participating within a system that is incredibly immoral, that they provide a financial capital for it. I wonder how they were able to do that. And then, and then that would force these individuals in the future, our future descendants say, wow, okay, the fact that they were able to do that and they were just normal, everyday individuals. Well, I want to be able to reevaluate re my own positions now. What things that uh, that I currently do might be immoral, considered immoral by future generations. That way, uh, my hope is that the moral arc of the universe, the moral arc of humanity, continues to progress in such a way that we dis we we continue to dispense of the systems of casual cruelty that we engage in and move toward a more kinder and humane society. I'll leave it at that. Those are very beautiful words, actually. Words, actually. So, uh, yeah, to finish up my version, I think it would be fitting to just respond why I care about judging humans when it comes to this question. And so my final piece would be that, to me, because someone's actions are a direct continuation of who they are, not necessarily something essentialistic, just you know, a character that is built also through actions, but because one is a continuation of the other, a discussion about the morals of any particular action has to take into account character. I think that the rhetorical aspect is, is a bit meta. Yes, it is a bit meta, but I think it is relevant uh, when we discuss morals because the way in which we talk about morals is part of the moral equation itself. It is part of what we think is right and wrong. Um, 
because of that i think that in order for us to to come to good conclusions regarding uh, veganism we have to take into account the moral subject to me that is character the moral world to me that'd be the realm of consequentialism the moral tools we use to navigate it that would be closer to the realm of uh, deontological ethics the person who uses those tools to navigate that world that would be the character and because of that i think that in my position about it like i said it isn't really anti-vegan it's so much as not vegan uh, it, it, it's just that uh, it's that rather than focusing precisely on a rule utilitarian rule you know a philosophy of say don't consume animal products we have to focus on the character of a person who will make that choice we have to construct we have to educate people in such a way that they will at the very least if not eat no meat or no animal products eat less of them we have to focus on the building of a good habit rather than a good rule. That is sort of my my take on it, and that is why I'm not a vegan. It's not that I don't think that that position has any virtue. It's more than I think the habit, the character of a person who has the, the skills to know that what they're doing is wrong, who has the skills to adapt their own actions to their own beliefs, is more important than establishing a rule, than establishing a general consequentialist rule. To me, that is my, my main take. So we have to focus less on the label of vegan as a broad, as a broad category and more into the habits that make for, uh, for a good society. And that's it. So a habit for that, uh, for that purpose, for me, would be to reduce animal consumption. Not necessarily eliminate it, but to heavily, heavily reduce it. All right. Well, that was a great talk, guys. Um, I hope to have you both back on pretty soon. And yeah. Well, maybe we'll even do a follow-up, get a lot of questions uh, for each of you guys. All right. Cool, cool. That was, very interesting. Good. Yeah, it was, it was nice uh, talking to you, Leonardo. Uh, am I pronouncing it right? Is it Leonardo or is it Leonardo? I don't... Is it, It's Leonardo, but I think you, you can call me Leonard. I think it, it sounds a bit better. <laughs> no, it's fine. You said uh, uh, Leonardo? Could you repeat Leonardo, it? see. Uh, Leonardo, okay, cool. Um, awesome. Uh, Carson, nice talking with you. Nice being here with you again. Thank yep. you. All right. You guys take care. Bye. See you.